Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kensington Congregational Church. I'm the Reverend Dr. Holly Norwick, and I am honored to be a part of this moment this morning. Please join me in our celebration of the life of Reverend Alan Humes. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Friends, we gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We are free to pour out our grief, release our anger, face our emptiness, and know that God cares. We gather here as God's people, conscious of others who have died and of the frailty of our own existence on earth. We come to comfort and to support one another in our common loss. We gather to hear God's word of hope that can drive our despair and move us to offer God our praise. We gather to commend to God with thanksgiving the life of Reverend Alan Humes as we celebrate the good news of Christ's resurrection. For whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ, who is Lord, both of dead and of the living. Gracious is our God and righteous, our God is full of compassion. I will walk in the presence of God in the land of the living. I will fulfill my vows to God in the presence of all God's people. The righteousness of God is the death of those who die in faithfulness. Please pray with me. Holy God, whose ways are not our ways, and whose thoughts are not our thoughts. Grant that your Holy Spirit may intercede for us with sighs too deep for human words. Heal our wounded hearts made heavy by our sorrow. Through the veil of our tears and the silence of our emptiness, assure us again that ear has not heard, nor eye seen, nor human imagination envisioned what you have prepared for those who love you, through Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. Amen. Amen. I now invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in the creed that is printed in your bulletin. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in the true man, Jesus, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by his spirit. We trust him. He calls us to be his church, to celebrate his presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please remain standing and join me. It is on page 238 in your pew hymnal, and we will sing verses 1 and 4.
You may be seated. A reading from the book of Psalms. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither, shall neither sleep nor slumber, slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Don't you know, haven't you heard? The eternal God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not grow tired nor become weary. His understanding is beyond reach. He gives strength to those who grow tired and increases the strength of those who are weak. Even young people grow tired and become weary, and young men will stumble and fall. Yet the strength of those who wait with the hope of the Lord will be renewed. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and will not become weary. They will walk and will not grow tired.
First reading is from Matthew 5, verses 3 through 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The second reading is from Matthew, chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then from Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people's. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I'll be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 28, 35 through 39. We know all, that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. In verse 35 through 39. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord.
Dad, what an immense subject to cover. <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, I believe each of us can recall stories of the many ways our lives have been impacted by his presence. As a father, dad, dad led by example and embraced those teachable moments at, as our, in our lives as they unfolded. I'd like to share a few of, of those teachable moments with you today in what I like to call Dad's Life Lessons. And while not an easy task, I've limited my comments to what I believe are his top three in Dad fashion, right? So here we go. In no particular uh, ranking order, Dad's Top Three Life Lessons. Number three. Enjoy the ride. And that he did. It was a beautiful early summer day, bright sunshine, and I was in the seventh grade at John Winthrop Junior High School. We are nearing the end of the school day and one more period to go. I sat in the second row near the open window in my American history class when the inter-office phone rang. Mr. Sullivan paused his lesson and picked up the receiver. 
After a few quiet words were exchanged, Mr. Sullivan turned to me and said, Wendy, gather your things. Your father's in the office to pick you up. What, me? <laughs> yes, you're dismissed. As I made my way to the locker to retrieve my coat and backpack, my mind began racing. What's wrong? Why is dad here to get me? Dad would never pull me out of class unless it was absolutely necessary. School was our job, and it always held a priority in our lives. So why? With a nervous grip, I opened the door to the main office and found Dad casually chatting with Mr. Doyle, our school principal. Well, he doesn't appear to be overly concerned about anything. And I thought as, I, as he turned to me, and he said, have you got everything? As I shook my head, he replied, great, let's go. Quickly, I, I turned to him and said, well, but wait a minute, what about Brian? In, 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 in my mind, we couldn't possibly leave without him, right? See, see Brian, Bri I had your back. Yeah. <sighs> but with a twinkle in his eye, Dad replied, nope. Just you. Brian will take the bus home. <laughs> now I'm really confused. As we exited the school, Dad was bouncing with excitement. Not what I was expecting at all. And there it was, sitting before us, his newly acquired Honda motorcycle <laughs> with two helmets. Dad, Dad leans over and he says, it's not much fun to ride alone. With that, we took off on two wheels for an afternoon adventure. Enjoy the ride. And ride we did. Each summer, the five of us would pack into our station wagon and load up our 15-foot Shasta trailer for a month-long family journey. With Dad at the wheel and a spare tire behind the driver's seat, well, that was fun, right? <sighs> we explored sites across the U.S. and much of Canada, always stopping to visit with friends and family along the way. In 1973, Dad's five-month sabbatical became a family overseas adventure as we navigated our way through Europe, England, and Scotland in a Volkswagen bus visiting centers of Christian renewal. What a ride that was. I know that many of you here today shared similar rides with Dad. Perhaps you sat in wonder across the bridge table as he raised your bid with no trump in hand, <laughs> or donned your favorite Yukon swag to share his excitement in watching the women Huskies march to victory in the Final Four. Or perhaps you shared the thrill of pulling in a boatload of bluefish, or the simple pleasure of, leaf, of a leaf-peeping excursion. Dad embraced life, and he enjoyed the ride. Life lesson number two, you are never alone. I was perhaps seven, maybe eight, and uh, the, traditional so the, the traditional social hour, which followed our Sunday service in Deep River, was just winding down. Mom had already started home to begin preparations for our Sunday meal. Looking about for Dad, I learned he had just headed into the sanctuary to close it up for the day. You better hurry, I was told. You can just catch him. So off I went, through the choir room and into the sanctuary. As I opened the sanctuary door, I called out, Dad, I heard no reply. Hmm, where is he? Not at the pulpit. Hmm, he's nowhere in sight. Ah, I thought, he must be in the back. So I headed toward the narthex. Hmm, not there either. Looks like I missed him. Oh, well, I, I'll just go home on my own then. It wasn't that far away. I reached for the big front door of the church, but it would not budge. Locked. With that, I began to retrace my steps and turn back toward the choir room. Little did I know that upon closing it behind me, it, too, was locked. There I was, locked in the sanctuary, alone, and starting to panic. 
Maybe he's right outside the door, I thought. So I began to yell, Dad! 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 Nothing. In that moment, the church felt so big and so very empty. Not knowing what to do next, I found comfort in Mrs. Arnold's seat. It was the last pew there on the left of the center aisle. Mrs. Arnold would always wait for me right there after each Sunday morning service with a hard candy just for me. <laughs> but even Mrs. Arnold's seat did not provide me the comfort I needed in that moment. I hung my head and I began to cry. What was I going to do? Just then, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Startled, I, I looked up and there was Dad. Out of nowhere, he just appeared. He sat down beside me and asked, why are you crying? After recounting my journey, Dad took me in his arms and said those words that I will never forget. You are never alone. But Dad, I was alone. You couldn't hear me, did you? No, I could not actually hear you. But I had locked up and I was on my way home and something came over me. I just knew that I had to come back. I didn't know why, I didn't know what for, but I knew I had to be here. God heard you. He's always listening and will be watching over us. He sent me back to you. Dad's teachable moment. His words have carried me through my life's deepest challenges and continues to lift me today. You are never alone. Life lesson number one. It's really more of a, a family legacy that Dad embraced from his parents, our grandparents. The three words we'd wait for at the end of each meal. Lollipop your fork. Family dinners were a must in the Hume's household. Sports practice, music rehearsals, church meetings or social events were always factored in to determine when family dinner took place. But it always took place. It was a time that we shared the events of the day, high points and challenges, and engaged in family discussions. Sometimes we shared our table with friends and extended family, particularly on Sundays and special occasions. But mostly I remember those intimate times around the table or a campfire with just the five of us. No one left until everyone had finished. It was house rule. As we neared the conclusion of the meal, Dad would make his announcement with great pleasure and anticipation. Lollipop your fork. This was our signal that there was more to come to lick our forks clean, clear the meal dishes, and prepare ourselves for the best part of the meal, dessert. <laughs> Dad loved a good dessert. <laughs> Dad, we live with the promise that the best is yet to come. And we're lollipopping our forks to you today. Your best has just begun. So some of my thoughts about Dad's ministry. So I remember a time when Dad was counseling a woman who was about 80 years old and about to get married for the fourth time. <laughs> this time, she was to marry a local funeral director. So Dad asked her about her previous marriages, and she told him, well, at 20, she married a bank manager. And at 40, she married a ringmaster. At 60, she married a pastor. And now at 80, a funeral director. <laughs> so dad asked her why. Well, she responded, 
one for the money, <laughs> two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <laughs> well, Dad loved to laugh, and he also loved to make others laugh. And now it's time for him to go. But he was sure that before he left us, we were ready. As you might have heard, Dad prearranged most of this service, including contacting all who were to participate, spoke with Pastor Holly, contacted Corey about the music, contacted the ushers by phone, phone calls, even contacted Gwen about the reception. <laughs> One thing he didn't, didn't orchestrate was what uh, we were going to say up here from the pulpit. But what I can say about his ministry is about how Dad really loved this church. In fact, he loved every pulpit that he spoke from, and he adored the people that he met along the way. I learned early that when you speak from this pulpit, you don't make more than three points, as Wendy said, <laughs> and you never go over 20 minutes. That was for sure. But when his days were limited, I had several opportunities to say goodbye. And on one visit, we spoke about the times that he has planned funerals for others and how he would convey to the families what a peaceful place heaven was going to be. I asked him if he was worried in any way. And while he says, while his head was on the pillow, he says, oh, I'm not worried about that at all. I'm just going to miss all the people that I love so much. Right now, I'm looking out at the people he was talking about. He loved all of you. And his ministry to you was a reflection of your ministry to him and also our family. You've continued to minister to us through your cards, your messages, your kind words. The family thanks you for that ministry. And for many of you here, he was your minister. Well, as Pastor Holly can probably attest, as growing up as a preacher's kid or a PK, we didn't grow up with a minister. We grew up with Dad. Dad's hours were irregular. He attended night meetings. His weekends were taken up by weddings and, and funerals. He always worked on Sunday. <laughs> but he had no regrets. Serving you was his joy in life. Many of you remember him by his stories, whether for here from the pulpit, through children's sermons, Magic, puppetry, a quick wit, or a serious word. In the fall of 2021, Dad had an idea. He wanted to write a book. Just like this Bible is a collection of short stories, he wanted to assemble the short stories of his life. Well, his idea quickly grew and evolved into a team. And while Dad wrote, Mom typed, Corey proofread, I printed and bound. And this book, this book was created. It's not 66 stories like the Bible, but it is a collection of 33 short stories about Dad's life. His not-so-humble title <laughs> is Musings from a Charmed Life. And in it, you learn about Argyle Socks, a true fish story, 
ginger sandwiches, <clears throat> Mr. Johnson's pumpkin, and many more. And when Dad put a Sunday bulletin together, the offering was always after the sermon. <laughs> For him, you heard the word, and then you reacted to the word. <laughs> well, we're not going to pass the plate today. But here is my offering to all of you. Dad has designated two meaningful causes that you can donate to. One is the Kensington Congregational Church's Memorial Gifts Funds that serves the congregation in special ways. And the other, administered through the Community Foundation of Greater New Britain, is the Allen and Rosalind Humes Humanitarian Scholarship Fund that for the last 20 years has been providing financial assistance to a graduating senior from either Deep River, Berlin, or Winchester, New Hampshire High School. These seniors must demonstrate an interest in pursuing a service-oriented field of study. So I offer to you, if any of you choose to donate to either of those causes, I will personally hunt you down, <laughs> and I will offer you a free electronic version <laughs> of Dad's book. This is not a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> this is not to be read in one sitting. But if you're interested in learning more about the life and the ministry of Dad, it may put a smile on your face. And one on my final visit with Dad, my last words to him were just two words. Well done. Now in thinking back, that was not my order to the chef on how he was to be cooked. <laughs> but it was my celebration of his life. With reference taken from Matthew 25, verse 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. So not only was dad a devoted husband, loving father, and a spiritual leader for two grateful congregations, he was also a leader within the community and an advocate for those that were less fortunate than others. American author and journalist Mitch Album is quoted to have said, the most important elements of faith are believing in something bigger than yourself and taking care of those less fortunate than you. This, I believe, was, was dad's ethos, the moral compass that drove his decision-making and actions. His concerns for the well-being of others was instilled in him in an early age. During the Christmas season, my grandmother would obtain the names of a boy and girl from a poor section of Hartford, and then take dad and his sister Shirley shopping so they could buy gifts for the two children. Just prior to Christmas, grandma would drive them to the children's home where dad and Shirley would leave the presents on the front door ring the doorbell, and then run back to the car before being seen. This lesson in unconditional giving was also instilled in us in, an early, in our early childhood as we were always encouraged to provide gifts to others. For as long as I can remember, the excitement and anticipation of Christmas was just, about, just as much about the giving as it was the receiving. Work camps played a big part in Dad's life. While in college at Earlham, Dad would travel to Indianapolis to build new housing projects for the poor in that city. Also during college, Dad spent one summer in Puerto Rico, tasked with providing water to a rural village, cutting and hollowing out 
large bamboo trees, they created a, a trough for about a half a mile, which brought water into a schoolhouse in the, in the village. The immense joy <clears throat> expressed by the school children over something just so natural, yet essential as water, um, left a strong impression that stayed with dad throughout his life. Over the years, dad had the opportunity to participate in many more work camps, returning to Puerto Rico several times, spending the summer in an orphanage for young boys in Tunisia. Throughout his ministry, dad organized work camps for other poor communities in Middlebury, Vermont, Baltimore, Maryland, Wheeling, West Virginia, and finally in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, repairing homes damaged by Hurricane Katrina. On a personal note, I'll always remember the trips we made as the Pilgrim Fellowship in Deep River down to the Elon Home for Children in Elon, North Carolina. This was my introduction to work camping, and it enabled me to witness firsthand the joy and satisfaction that comes from helping others. While giving of himself to serve others was rewarding, Dad's ultimate dreams were bigger than that. He was always a champion for social justice, equality, and inclusion in a world that, to him, seemed far too divisive, combative, and maybe even cruel. One of the true light highlights of his life was attending the 1963 March on Washington standing beneath one of the few shade trees beside the Lincoln Memorial, and listening to the inspirational words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Those images and words were forever etched into his memory and motivated him to initiate and lead equality and inclusion programs throughout the communities where he served. While in Deep River, Dad organized and led many ecumenical services across the shoreline area. Here in Kensington, he established sister churches in both El Salvador and in nearby New Britain, bringing together people of different cultures, backgrounds, and opportunities, all to share their love of God and one another. Even in retirement, he continued to unite and connect people with different backgrounds as he, as he led devotional and worship services for Holland America cruise lines throughout all seven continents. I believe that Dad's community leadership and devotion to others is what encouraged me to choose a career in public service and work for something greater than myself. Dad inspired others to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. I'd like to believe that Dad left a little bit of that devotion in all of us. In the words of singer-songwriter Dan Fogelberg, which I've slightly altered for this occasion, <laughs> the leader of the band has died. His eyes were growing old, but his blood runs through our instrument, and his song is in our souls. Our lives have been a poor attempt to imitate the man, for we are a living legacy to the leader of the band. So, Dad, we're here to today to celebrate your life, a life full of abundant joy, generous love, and devotion to others. Thanks for all you've done to inspire us and to mold us into the people we are today. Your dream lives on in all of us, and we look forward to the day when we can celebrate with you again in his kingdom. We love you.
And now I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in our next hymn, Because He Lives. It is an insert in your bulletin. may be seated. Please pray with me. 
Merciful God, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp for our feet, a light for our path. We thank you especially that in the night of our grief, in the shadows of our sorrows, we are not left to ourselves. We have the light of your promises to sustain and comfort us. Through our tears, give us vision to see in faith the consolation you intend for us. In your mercy, grant the unfailing guidance of your saving word, both in life and in death. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer, giver of life and conqueror of death, we praise you with humble hearts, with faith in your great mercy and wisdom. We entrust Reverend Humes to your eternal care. We praise you for the steadfast love for him all the days of his earthly life, and we thank you for all that he was to those who loved him. Lord, it is through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we have gathered today in sorrow and in reflection, and it is through your Son that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as it is custom for worship here at Kensington Congregational Church, I invite you to please stand as we sing the first verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. And if you would, during Reverend Humes' tenure here is when we began to hold hands for this song. So I invite you to come together. The family invites all of you to join them in our fellowship hall immediately following this service as the refreshment is provided by Women's Service League. Please allow the family to be dismissed first and then follow the directions of the ushers going straight into the fellowship hall and finding your seat. Thank you.